Hi, this is Catherine. This is Taking Tea with Catherine. This is China Rose Black Tea, which I really like, from McNulty's. I was really close to McNulty's last week. I had an appointment in the city. And I was so close, but it was after having walked a bit, and it was kind of cold, and I was hungry. And I realized that if I made that detour, it would probably be not great for me in the long run. So... Now I look forward to going back there another time. And if I do, I'll have a haul. But I really, I have enough teas right now. <laughs> but very nice, very refreshing. Um, so <laughs> a little bit of a weird angle today. So I thought I'd do a wrap up. And I might, if I, if I see that I have enough time, I might actually do a haul as well. It's a small haul. Small haul. But it's part of all the large hauls that I've been doing lately. <laughs> So I'm doing everything gradually, but I do, I'm going to do a January wrap up. And when I say January, I really mean the last half because I did a mid month, mid month in January. I kind of just don't want to re you know, review every single uh, book I've read in a month at once because that's just, it's a lot. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to break it up a little bit. And of course, anything from the mystery genre, I will save for another video where I will wear my hat. But this time I will talk about four books that I've read uh, recently. And I did break a record this month, even though I'm determined not to get too much into numbers. Uh, and every month will be different. Some months I probably won't read as much. So I don't mind being a little proud of myself that I broke a record. It's not, it's not really a big deal, uh, considering the fact that a good chunk of these books were pretty small books. But in my adult life, as far as I could see, I think my record is usually the most nine a month, maybe 10, but I think nine. So this uh, past month I read 11 books in completion. I mean, and that is good. And if I do that another month, that's fine, but I'm not really focusing on numbers, but you know, I know we share our stats a little bit, but you know, so I will talk about the first two books that are the short books that when you'll see them, you'll say, Oh yeah. That's why she read so many books. But um, when I say so many, some people read a lot more than I do. It's not a competition. And then you'll see the other two books and you'll say, oh, wow. You know, <laughs> those were slightly bigger books. Not nothing too chunky. But anyway, so, so the first one I'm going to mention, I've talked about already on this channel. I've had a Helene Hanf thing this month. I might just do that every January and thereabouts. We'll see. But this is the one uh, called Letter from New York. Um, BBC Women's Hour broadcasts, and by the author of 84 Charing Cross Road. So, you know, Helene, Helene Hamp was basically a writer, and, um, but people were interested in her because she wrote 84 Charing Cross Road, and people wanted probably to know a little bit more about her life in New York. So they had a broadcast, I guess, I don't know. It says Women's Hour, I don't know, I don't think these lasted an hour, but however long it lasted, she would, um, basically tell about that month and what life was like in New York, usually about life in New York. One, one month she talked a little bit about visiting her friend in California. Um, Maxine, the one who, if you saw the film or if you read the book, this was her, her actress friend who, um, who was her friend that you, <laughs> that you would have seen and, uh, who gradually or eventually moved out to Los Angeles, you know, and, even though it's nice that she visited her, I don't, I think she probably, Helene probably preferred New York in the long run. That was more her speed, as it is mine, basically. I did visit my friend in San Diego in 2019 and really liked it, but I don't see living there anytime soon, although I did like San Diego quite a lot. Anyway, um, so 1978 to 1984 is a time period where I existed. I was just very young and I didn't live in Manhattan. So, um, it was a slightly different life maybe than the one I lived, but there are aspects of it that are, are similar, the neighborhood feeling, you know, kind of knowing all of your neighbors. Uh, even so, I think Helene was a lot more involved, not nosy per se, but involved in her neighbor's lives. Like some, some of them who lived close by were just really good friends. She had one who I think might be still alive now. As of a few years ago, there was something about her, um, who was pretty well off and, and the same size as her. So she would give Helene her, her kind of calf stuffs, you know, 
and but they were expensive. So can you imagine if you had a friend who had expensive clothes who would just, you know, buy new ones all the time and give you her old stuff? If you liked her things anyway, that would be pretty amazing. And she also, Helene, was involved in the dogs of her building and thereabouts. And you do learn about some of the dogs, one of which was mentioned in Apple of My Eye um, as her one true love. And then there's other dogs, some of which have kind of sad stories, but then end up being really kind of part of the life of the neighborhood. And just different, different shops that open up and different things that happen in the neighborhood. Just, you know, a little bit of background about the history of certain places, but just generally what it's like to kind of live in the city. And by the city, I mean Manhattan, because that's basically what she talks about, and that's okay. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm from the, a borough, so it's like I, I always get a little defensive of like, you know, it's more than just Manhattan. But I also understand. I understand that. But I've talked about that before. So I would say this isn't like, you know, roll on the floor hilarious, but it was still pretty good. It's still kind of fun also to say what is still the case now. Like some things are still that way and some things aren't. At one point she covers different catalogs that she gets for around Christmas time. You know, these, these gift catalogs. And one is a really expensive one that she obviously can't afford, but she'll just tell you certain things that you can buy if you have this kind of money. One of which was a, um, like an exercise bike, I think, that had a video screen, which now is so popular and so not common, but you see it a lot. I don't have one. Actually, I probably should. I could use the exercise, but, but for now, it just, it was such a um, novelty back then. Now, you know, it's commonplace, but I just, I just like to think that, you know, nothing new, right? Uh, moving on, not, not entirely a change from this one, because we're going to talk about bookshops, which people think of when they think of Lane Hamp, even though she wasn't one to spend a lot of time inside of them, I guess. Um, I got the latest Sean Bythel. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation of his name. Pronunciation. Can't even say that now because I've, I've looked into it. And I still can't figure out what the correct pronunciation is, but, um, whatever. He wrote two previous books about life in his bookshop. He, he lives and works in, uh, I think the largest one in his town, but in a book town, he owns a bookshop and it sounds amazing. I would love to visit it one day. I don't know how I would, but never know. And it's, you know, basically a used bookshop um, for the most part. Maybe his own books might be new, <laughs> but it just, yeah, they were day by day, day to day, day by day, every day accounts of what happened in, in the shop and how much money they made even, the people who work there, the people who come in there. Sometimes humorous, sometimes a little bit cranky. And you do learn a little bit about what it takes to run a bookshop. Not all fun. Some of it is fun, but uh, a lot of it is hard work. You just, you never know what you're going to encounter. So this is his latest offering, and that is um, seven kinds of people you find in bookshops. And I actually like this, this um, cover a lot. I've seen a couple of different types of covers, but I like, I like this one. Just all kinds of people reading and a cat. Uh, he has a cat still. And um, he just kind of does it like a, almost like a nature study. And so like Janice, is that how you it? Janice, 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 me and science. Just like, he, he uses kind of like, I don't think proper Latin, I'm not sure, but like to have different kind of species or different types of, different types of people that you will find in bookshops. Uh, the loiterer, the young family, the expert, the bearded pensioner, the not-so-silent traveler, the family historian. In Scotland, you're going to get a lot of family historians. Anybody who has a Scottish background and goes to Scotland gets a little bit like, oh, maybe I should look into my name. I wouldn't know anything about that. But anyway, um, and also staff. He talks about staff. And um, some, I, I was hesitant at first to get this book because some reviewers said, oh, he's so mean. Why would you complain about people who, you know, who visit your shop and, and, you know, give you money and stuff like that? And I get that, but I don't think they really understand that he is cranky, but he's also quite affectionate. And even in his introduction, he's very, um, or prologue, whatever, uh, he's, he is affectionate and he, and he does speak of kind of missing that kind of daily traffic during, during, uh, lockdown and everything, because that's it. This came out right around that time. So can you imagine 
dealing with foot traffic all the time, good and bad, and then suddenly not so much. So I kind of take his, you know, I kind of defend him a little bit because anyway, this is fun. I would say though, get the first two books, the diary of a bookseller, confessions of a bookseller first, because then you might understand a little bit more. But anyway, I got this and another book recently, uh, from Blackwell's, which is a book shop a number of bookshops, I guess a chain of bookshops that they have in the UK. I visited the one in Oxford when I was in Oxford that one day, which was lovely. Um, oh, I really missed that. But anyway, um, they, they shipped to the United States for free. So, and their prices were not bad because this and the other book I had thought about getting from book depository, which I normally do when I order books from the UK. And these ended up being actually less, expensive not by a lot but a little bit and I was like well good so so I was very happy about that I there's another book I plan to order soon but not today anyway so yeah I do I thought this was a really good book uh I just you know I, I don't think it's like the book of the year but I, I had a nice time reading it and it just even that feeling if you miss being in a bookshop that's the kind of thing one should read it's humorous but and you can look at yourself and say am I that kind of person am I annoying but then most people will not be that way quite. And I don't think he would mind anyway. Honestly, I think, I think if he, I think he would be very happy for anybody to visit his shop at this point, you know? Anyway, so moving on. So I read two classics and I mean, I read other books, I guess that you could consider classic the past month, but these are like the, especially this next one, the real heavy hitter. I did a, I participated in a group read, which is good because it gave me the discipline to read a little bit every day at first. And then at the very ending, the last week of January, I took a couple days and just finished it and went off schedule, went ahead because I just really wanted to see how it would end. Um, but I was glad that I did that daily read at the beginning because it gave me the discipline not to give up on it, but also to enjoy because you, you read just enough that you can still like it but not get overwhelmed so i'm talking about crime and punishment by dostoevsky and it is the first that i know of first russian novel classic anyway that i completed because i can't think of anything else that i completed i i still haven't finished or barely began war and peace by tolstoy and i also had made some progress in anna karenina many years ago and i want to read that one too but we'll see but I have had this copy for a long time and I always said to myself, I'll read it. And I never did. And I think in this case, I just didn't want to read it alone. And then I didn't. So that was good because um, there were some people who were reading it for the first time and a couple of other people who were a little, it was not the first time and they could be a little helpful explaining in the group. And I liked that. And also I watched some videos um, of, of people who explained parts of the plot and meaning in it. My, my, purpose when I was reading this though wasn't to read it in a scholarly way like to get every meaning out of it every theme or whatever as I usually am not when I read a book for the first time it really was just to read it for the story and to see if I liked it I mean the story is a little sad but not every minute and I could handle it anyway um so it's about this man and I'm not good with the names by the way so sorry about that welcome to the butcher shop um, Raskolnikov, I think his name is, oh my, Raskolnikov, anyway. Uh, and he is the person who create, who, uh, commits the crime, and it is a bit of a, his reasons for it, as you, as his, his justification goes into all kinds of philosophical discussions and all kinds of, doesn't always make sense. Because he otherwise isn't really what you would think of as a criminal. He can be quite giving and sacrificing in some ways. And also he could be quite despairing and depressed in a lot of other ways. But he doesn't, he just doesn't seem like the type. So that kind of leads to the punishment. It's not always just external. Some of it is very much internal. So you go through that and all the people involved in his life. His friend, who is one of the best characters. His sister and his mother and his sister's fiance and this man he runs into, you know, um, and learns his life story and ends up getting involved with his family. 
and I guess a few other people <laughs> in his life. Oh, you know, some some police, doctors, things like that. And uh, and you wonder how what's gonna how this is gonna turn out. I found it. I don't want to say what happened, but I found the ending actually satisfying, pretty much. So I was like, man, that's great. But yeah, some of the philosophical things I could have done without, but they weren't like too long-winded, so that was okay. Um, there's a whole thing. He's got a little bit of an obsession with Napoleon, I think. Not a Napoleon complex or whatever you call that, but more of just this theory almost that there are people out there to which, in their, at least to them, laws don't quite apply to them. And using Napoleon as an example, I don't know if he, if his argument is actually successful, but it's his argument. Um, and, um, they, they talk about things like I was think uh, there was this one part, uh, where they're discussing, um, kind of psychology and, um, they're talking and they say this, there's in Paris, they've been conducting serious experiments as to the possibility of curing the insane simply by logical argument. So there's like all these, that time period and, and different theories and striving to understand the human mind and how to treat it, you know, and all kinds of sicknesses. So I kind of, I, I like that. It was a little bit forward thinking in, in some ways. And there was one scene which was both cringy and amazing and sometimes funny, but also quite cringy. Um, not in the ending, but toward the ending where there's this dinner, uh, a funeral dinner, but I'm not going to say of whom that is just out of control. All the things that happen it, that in itself, even though it was, you know, not always happy was just like such a work of art to me. So I would say if you're looking for a cheerful, happy, go lucky, or, you know, everybody is just dancing in the streets, happy. No, <laughs> this is not for you, but it wasn't, well, I didn't cry or feel terribly sad. I, you know, there's some things I thought were unjust or kind of messed up and, you know, that I didn't love to read about, but I, I felt generally okay reading this one. Then again, I read Les Miserables for fun when I was like 16. So <laughs> I don't know. But then again, sometimes I avoid things that I hear are sad. I don't know. Last but not least is Framley Parsonage, which I read um, by Anthony Trollope. It's the next one in his Barsetshire series. Probably not my favorite one, but definitely not bad. Like I gave it a four star, but I, some of his books I've given five stars to, but four star I think is still good. I don't know ratings, but there are a number of characters in here, none of which are thoroughly horrible. Well, maybe one. I don't know. Even the people who aren't really great sometimes have something that justifies them or, or that you almost feel sorry for them. I mean, like the main characters, there are, char there are people who are brought in from the earlier books that I still don't like very much, but, uh, but this, but, but the characters are introduced are pretty good, <laughs> if that makes sense. So it has, you know, the issues of class system and how that affects people's relationships and yeah, marriages and what, what makes a good match basically. And also just the simple life of, you know, vicars, parsons, that kind of thing. And and how they're influenced by society around them. How some who live in very humble circumstances live a certain way, but might be over proud. And how some are basically decent people, but just get into the wrong influences and get themselves in a bit of trouble. But yeah, everybody was pretty much um, good, I think. I mean, not good, but you know, that of the main characters, um, aside from maybe one, most of them are pretty decent people that you were kind of rooting for. Um, I, just, I thought this was a funny line when this one girl was maybe, you know, having feelings for someone, but knew it probably wasn't right. So she's talking to someone else, um, about maybe just getting away. So she says, yes, yeah, something must be done. If I were a man, I should go to Switzerland, of course, or as the case is a bad one, perhaps as far as Hungary. What is it that girls do? They don't die nowadays, I believe. I just thought it was kind of funny. It almost makes, makes fun of like the hell dramatic thing about women who, you know, who are dealing with uh, sadness in their love life, who would just like, you know, die of broken heart or whatever. So I like that about Trollope. He, he, he's not just mocking people, but he does sort of make, and yet he makes references to the romantics. He quotes Byron like a lot in, in this book, especially toward the beginning. And there's all kinds of like comparisons to Olympus and gods and giants and stuff that I was not that into, but 
so you know, because I'm not really into the politics when he when he writes about that. But even so, I think I'm gonna keep going and read uh, the Palisers when I'm done with this series. And I'm very much looking forward to reading the next The Small House at Allington. Allington? I think so. Anyway. <laughs> so that is that is everything for um, for my reading. I thought, I know it's kind of getting late, but if you're done with, with the wrap-up and you don't feel like seeing a minor haul, then goodbye for now. But if you want to stay on, I'm just going to show you three books I bought recently from The Strand. So I told you about that... Um, visit to the city I had to take and uh I had taken a day off so I didn't do the normal things I do when I'm in that neighborhood uh going out to tea and sympathy and stuff like that because I couldn't and I mean some people do dine out I just don't yet but I could go to the Strand and I did and I just got three books and I didn't need any of them but I was ah you know <laughs> so this one is a mystery I have been reading the um Dorothy L. Sayers, um, Lord Peter Whimsey books. Well, I haven't recently been reading any of them, but oh, last year I read quite a few of them or a couple of them anyway. And this one is actually out. It's, it's a little further in from what I started, but I kind of am at the point where I don't mind if I read out of order because I already know about his relationships. So it doesn't, that's not a spoiler for me. This is a book I started and liked, and I guess it was probably due with the library or something. So I just had too much out what I do to myself. Um, this is Gaudy Night. So um, I don't even know if this is my favorite cover, but I have been looking for ages for a copy of this. And even like at Book Off and um, Argosy and all the other bookshops I've been at. And even online. And I haven't really found a good, you know, copy. Watch me find one like as soon as this is in my hands, right? But I kind of like the, the feeling of this one, and it was a good price, and I look forward to reading this one hopefully soon, maybe in March. We'll see. I don't know. I have so much to read. We shall see. This was kind of, I saw this when I was looking in the Oxford World's Classics, and it kind of looks silly, but I kind of also just want it. And uh, it's called Who Betrays Elizabeth Bennet? Further Puzzles in Classic Fiction by John Sutherland. So I thought it'd be kind of fun. Someone out there compa compared that chapter to, is his name John Mullins? I'm not sure. He, the one who wrote that book about Jane Austen. Oh, I'm forgetting what it's called. What Matters in Jane Austen, I think. Anyway, which was really amazing, but but they said he was better. But I don't know but that John Southern went not so much, but we'll see. This was written, I think, in the 70s or the 80s. I can't remember exactly. Um, but it talks about different... Oh, Freddy. I know you can't really see him, but Freddy's on my lap now. Um... Ow, 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 Freddy, ow, 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 I am not your pincushion. Um, Vanity Fair, um, David Copperfield, Ruth by Elizabeth Gaskell, um, Henry Esmond, Bleak House, North and South, uh, Tale of Two Cities, Great Expectations, um, I, I, The Way We Live Now. So a lot of books that I have read and some that I haven't. So I might enjoy just delving into the ones I have read and then maybe waiting for the other ones. And then, um, Freddy. Okay, this one just sounded like, you know, one of those books about books kind of sounded almost Jasper Ford, but maybe not quite. That's the unlikely escape, sorry, my hands, of Uriah Heep by H.G. Parry. So I like the cover. Look at that. So it says, um, for his entire life, Charlie Sutherland has concealed, uh, Sutherland? There's two Sutherlands. Anyway, has concealed an unusual ability he can't quite control. He can bring characters from books into the real world. Da. It's kind of fun, right? But kind of crazy. But when literary characters start causing trouble throughout the city and threatening to destroy the world, he learns he's not the only one with his ability. Now it's up to Charlie and his reluctant older brother Rob to stop them, hopefully before they reach the end. In caps. Um, so I think that could be fun, I hope. Uh, it came with this in here like a library checkout thing, uh, I, which we used to have at libraries before everything was, you know, electronic. It has a uh, Darcy's in here. Dorian Gray signed this. Oh, like 19. I guess it's 2019. Uh, Charlie Sutherland is the last one. Anna Karenina's in here. This is kind of cool. I could use this as a bookmark, maybe. Anyway, so yeah, this is up my alley. This is like the Pages & Co. also. All those things where people from books come into normal life 
little do you know that you're also a person in a book. So yeah, those are the three books I got. The Strand, um, I just love being able to pop in there when I can, but I can't get there all the time. So that was a good opportunity. So let me know if you've read any of these books. Some of you have, I know, um, and what you thought and both of the books that are hauls are the books that I wrapped up. I uh, hope you've had a great month. Hope you could share with me down below also what you read this past month. I would be pleased to hear it or I'll watch your videos if you are making videos. So this is Catherine taking tea with Catherine and this is Freddie on my lap. You can't really see him but he's very painful. <laughs> Have a lovely tea. Yes Freddie. Have a lovely tea and book filled day.